Hello and welcome to Breaking Ground on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon. The show where we chat to industry experts and get a view of what's happening on the ground and indeed learn about new trends emerging from within the construction industry. The show is brought to you in partnership with Place Engage, a data-driven platform for more successful public consultation and community engagement for your next development project. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Catherine Evans, founder of Bold as Brass. Catherine, I am already a fan from following your social media. You're you're so welcome today. But please tell people, our audience, what Bold as Brass is and what the initiative is all about. Hello and thank you. Um, Bold as Brass is a network that I set up last year to support women. And initially, it was just a support network for women who are working in mining in South Wales, Southwest kind of way because there's a lot of initiatives going on at the moment um quickly realized that this isn't just a mining thing this is this could do for every other thing that I've worked in as well so I started um I started adding people to the group who I've worked with turned out there was a lot they started adding them to the group and it just it grew massively um we added an allies group to for anybody to learn how they can be a better ally and support um, the intersectional experience of women in the business. And now we have a thousand members. So we don't just support, we also, I, I range with a really lovely group of um, volunteer career coaches to do career coaching for the, the women in the group because they often don't have access to any of that. Um, we do campaigns, we do uh, the support for we do support calls if anybody's having a difficult time then I can find them somebody to speak to or they can speak in the group and we also we arrange get-togethers which haven't happened yet I'm hoping we're going to get one this this Christmas um, but get-togethers to actually have a bit of networking time because it's such an important thing I think women get left out of networking opportunities so often because we aren't at those higher levels, the things that are causing the gender pay gap. Um, those those networking opportunities to meet other women, feel what they go, are going through, understand how they can make it better, share ideas, really, really important and something that we wanted from the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm interested that this has come from a place of trying to, I suppose, look out for women in mining. And a lot of what you're saying will resonate with our audience who will be familiar with various initiatives for women in construction. And I suppose what, what drew me to a lot of the content you're putting out on social media is I, I could see the natural overlap. Um, but you know, there were a lot of, shared frustrations um so b- before we move on to that because i'm conscious i'm a little bit of a one trick pony i only ever want to talk about construction but i am curious about um about the experience of say women in mining so uh, and i know nothing about mining so tell me um from your own experience there in south wales are there many women involved in the mining industry um no when i worked it was a coal mine it's still going um but pretty small operation I think compared to what it used to be um, and the markets have completely changed but when he was there there were a couple of women that worked on the surface and the the roles that you would expect to find women in the like HR accounting um, environment and then there was me who worked underground and I was the only one who went underground sometimes our environmental um, coordinator would go underground not very often because most of the things that she could actually influence were off the surface. So yeah, it was just me. Um, I don't think there was anybody else. There were any other women actually working underground in South Wales at that time. Um, but then let's let's talk about your personal experience if you're happy to do it. How did you find being the only woman, uh, um, not just in a male-dominated industry, but in a male-dominated workplace underground? I presume that's that that's an added layer of pressure and and I, I I I can only think of the word stifling, but it's stifling in every respect. Yes, my, my mom always said not to go down dark alleys with strange men, and this was just it's just all strange men in dark alleys. So it sort of went against everything you've ever been told. Um, but they were genuinely really really nice fellas. There were occasions that it was what was being said wasn't okay. And what was being done wasn't okay. It was kissed on the lips on the ground. We're talking about, yeah, 
talk about that recently. Um, did because it was so green, so new, didn't know what to do. And if that happened now, oh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't end well. But at that time, just had to laugh it off. Um, I think you learnt to fight your battles. Um, when you're the only woman, they're the only other, then you really have to pick those battles, um, work out who your allies are. And I learnt how to make really good, not just colleagues, but friends from working underground. That com- the camaraderie, that experience working underground where people's lives were in each other's hands it's completely different to anything else I've worked in and it feels like that's something that I'm always striving for is that tribal camaraderie and that was something that's that's what I feel I'm making with Bowler's Brass and what I feel my purpose is is to create change through building camaraderie um it was it was it different but also the best job that I ever had and I do it again in a heartbeat you know that that I, I I'm actually experiencing the whole range of emotions as you're talking me through that because I, I like first of all I'm genuinely sorry that you've had that experience um initially but you know I can see that you are able to look at the the totality of the experience and say what was very good and what was unacceptable and I you know and I'm glad you shared that experience because there's there is a difference to how we react. Uh, when we're new, junior, um, inexperienced, just young um, to compare to, you know, maybe when you have a decade of experience under your belt or you're fast approaching middle age and you have a, you know, you have a congenital right to be cranky. You know, the, these are these are things that change over time. But I'm really happy to hear you say the word. It's not just about being the only woman underground. You were the only other. And I think that is such a perfect way to say this, because actually, I think the conversation we're having, whether it's about mining or construction or any other industry, we need to move past gender as the conversation around diversity. It really is about um, others and whatever is other. So whatever the experience is. So, for example, I've plenty of friends who are school teachers and quite frankly, in primary schools, the experience of being other is being a male teacher. So um, so it is about this experience of other. And then we can go far beyond gender. We can go beyond age. We can go across multidisciplines um, and, and we can talk about different ethnicities in a way that in, I don't know what it's like in South Wales and Ireland. The conversation is really only getting started. And I wouldn't say we're navigating it well. I'd say we're erring on the side of caution, which is creating a barrier in itself. Um, so I, I, I'm i glad that you phrased it beyond gender and it is about other. Um, but that leads us into, I, I suppose, the area of overlap with mining and construction. And the one that really caught my attention online when you were talking about it, PPE gear. Talk to me about your your experience of PPE gear. Yeah, my first was my first job I worked offshore. And it was the first bit of PPE, I guess, I put on that wasn't I had my orange coveralls which were terrible but I thought well this is PPE I don't really know any different and this is this is an orange coverall that I'll wear when I work offshore but the real issue came when I was being told off for wearing um, like a buoyancy suit which are they've got little shoes cut into them or on them already so you put it all on the wrists are tight it's tight around there and if the chopper goes down that's what will save you because it will hold a layer of warm air that will keep you afloat and keep you warm in the north sea mine gaped at the neck the wrists were loose and i would get told off for wearing it it's like i've been handed this and they've told me they don't have any extra smalls because there's nothing to fit five foot two welsh catherine when this is um, an industry full of nine foot Viking Dutchmen. <laughs> so it's just it was it was bonkers. And that feeling of like being being chastised for being the other again. And um, that was just um just started from there really and was carried on my entire career, being told off for being different. Um, well, first of all, I'm I'm actually going to have to side with the health and safety people here and say that you weren't being chastised um you were being chastised for not having the right gear as such it was that it, it was a breach of safety 
for that not to fit you properly. So I suppose, um, you know, from the health and safety person's perspective, it was what's the alternative? Do they deny you access to your workplace? In which case you can imagine kind of the the storm of outrage that would happen at that. But um, I, you know, you have shared this experience online and I have been sitting there reading that with another point of frustration going off in my head. And that is because I am not five foot two. I am. I, I. I. I used to say I was six foot two. I think I've shrunk down to six foot or six foot one now. But in any event, I am about a foot taller than you. But I'm still not the shape of your Viking men that you talked about. I still have a woman's shape. So actually, PPE gear in the shape of women. You know, you make the point very articulately, and you're absolutely right that women are not just small men. But as somebody who has been involved in sailing and water sports and all that to wear just tall men's wetsuits or sailing gear or oilies. I would make the point that tall women aren't just tall men either. So actually, we need to reimagine PPE gear, not just for different sizes, but for different shapes. So um, you've been you've been championing this for a while. Are we making any progress? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. The way that Yesterday, I met with um, Scott Tonkin from Roots Original, and they make coveralls. I got on today because I wanted to try it on. And the original one that he sent to me was size 10 to 12, and I put it on, and it was skin tight. So I had my 10-year-old neighbor come around to, to, to put it on. It, it fit him perfectly. Um, and a coat that he'd sent me, which was the wrong coat, it turned out, but it was an extra small man's gave it to my husband to put on, fit in perfectly as a medium-sized man. So this is how big that was. Yesterday, Scott turned up and he had this, this larger sized coverall, which is a 12 to 14. He'd also realized from feedback that we've given them that their sizing system is completely off compared to the UK. The way that a lot of other countries will measure is they measure the garment. Whereas in the UK, I don't know how it is in Ireland, Do you measure the body. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I've never, I've never thought about it. No. no, I didn't have any idea. So most people won't realize when they go and take their measurements, they'll take it off their body as they think they're doing properly. Um, but the sizes in have a, a size given to them to choose this one. It gets sent to them. And it's one to two sizes too small because it's they've taken the wrong measurements, didn't realize. So that's been changed now. So it'll all be the same as what you'd expect in the UK, which means less returns. So less greenhouse gas emissions when they go back, less waiting time because these are designed and, and made for the people who order them in a lot of cases. So that's a lot of wasted energy because just for a simple thing that the size and structure wasn't right. And that's what we need to see is changes being made when we do make a comment. Um, now, I, again, before you really brought this conversation um to the fore, I have to be honest, I was one of these people that just accepted it. I just didn't, I, I, I just have gone through decades of wearing ill-fitting, whether it's wetsuits or sailing gear or PPE. You know, I, I just put up, put up with decades of it being ill-fitting. And, um, it, you know, so actually I, I'm really happy that you didn't just accept it, that you are actually championing change. I think it's so important and so admirable. Um, but when you go to champion change, how do you even approach that? I mean, did you reach out to the PPE uh, providers, to the manufacturers? I don't even know where PPE gear is manufactured. It changes a lot. It's mostly, um, we're talking like Sri Lanka and India, um, Pakistan, China, all depends. On, and depending on the business that you're working with, sometimes they own the entire chain from the design all the way through to getting it back to the to the the shop, I guess, the shop front. Sometimes they own just tiny bits of the chain, which means that other people are part of that chain as well. So you see that there um there's a lot of waiting. And if there's a shortage of something here, there was a shortage of orange dye, I believe, at the beginning of last year. Um, then that gets affected further down the line. And I was told that was because all of this orange dye was coming from Ukraine. And that had a real big impact. I don't know whether that was true or not, so I wouldn't check that one. Um, 
but the way that I started it was um, just a colleague and I were discussing how hot we were in work. It, it was a, a male colleague. And he said, surely there must be some fabric that we can wear, like sports fabric in orange with the stripes on that we can wear to keep us cool because we're sweating in the southeast. It's so hot in, in Norfolk. It's so dry. So I just put something out to say if there's anybody making anything because us at our age are absolutely boiling. Do you think perhaps women who are going through the most menopause experiencing flushes? And I know certainly with myself, menstrual thermal issues i get absolutely boiling days before my period and then freezing afterwards because of the the change in iron in my blood um these things nobody's really thinking about because i guess everybody's designing from experience of being a man so it was so good to find women designers um Pulsa leo have got women designers and we work with them a lot they're fantastic always listen always ask for feedback always ask what else can we do they're brilliant um but yeah it was a case of then contacting or being contacted and generally just networking building relationships helping them realize that i'm not doing this for me this is for everybody and i want to make it better because i want it to be i want there to be equity so we can actually have a chance of reaching our our best um, Catherine, you have blown my mind. As a woman, it has never occurred to me that actually even the weight of PPE gear would be different, uh, particularly for people at perimenopause or menopause stage, or even for some women who experience changes throughout their menstrual cycle. That has never crossed my mind. And I am a woman. So how can we expect men to remember that? And I'm, I'm not saying that as an excuse. I'm saying, you know, this is just the level of almost institutionalizing that has happened across the industry and I wonder is this part of me being middle-aged as opposed to somebody coming in I wonder I wonder is the next generation in their early 20s coming in and saying hold on a second I'm not wearing this at certain times or hold on a sec you know I, I wonder is there more pushback um you now have a really strong sample group dare I say with your with your thousand members what industries are they coming from? So mining, clearly, I presume a lot in construction. What other kind of industries? And we have a lot of geologists because I'm a geologist. Really? I've met a lot of geologists. I think geology is a bit of a, a hidden um, a hidden career in everything. You, you always have to have some form of geologist, geotechnical engineer, uh, engineering geologist, if you're building on the ground. So if you're in the ground, in a hole on the ground, or building upwards, the foundation is is the important part. So plenty of engineers, plenty of geologists from consultancies, highways, rail. Um, we've got women and people from uh, offshore energy, um, both both um, like fossil fuels and renewables. We've got there's a lot of women from Drax power station, biomass power station. So energy is quite a big one. Uh, who else? There's women who work in different industries who are also experiencing the issues with PPE. So they, it's not this kind of PPE, but it's other kind of PPE where it's the same thing. It's all designed for men, like we, we saw with the health services during COVID. It's all PPE for people who don't, who aren't, they're not even like the overrepresented group. That thing, oh, the thing about like, climbing my kitchen because I can't reach the top shelf. And yet women, there's no woman's place in the kitchen. <laughs> I don't know how it goes. But things just aren't designed for us. Yeah, and it does come down to design. I'm I'm involved a lot in placemaking. Um, and, you know, we can see that that has, you know, certainly up until at least maybe two to three decades ago was, was so strongly the domain of men that actually we can see areas where push chairs can't get through um, certain areas. And again, actually, it's, it's almost incredibly sexist to say that's a woman's issue. It absolutely isn't. Uh, but it's more a case of more inclusive design um, and that uh, by involving people who might have had a better insight into the experience of using uh, a footpath or something like that. Um, so we're seeing this in so many areas. Um, but actually, you've really 
opened my eyes actually around maybe the different stages that women are at. Do you know, has there been any research about women leaving um, any of the, I, I suppose, leaving more technical roles or hands-on roles or on-site roles um, as they're approaching menopause or perimenopause for this very reason? Is there any data around that? Yes, yeah. The, this is called the leaky pipeline. And even okay. that's happening, yeah, where women at that point in their career where if they were a man, they'd be going into a pretty high level because they're so experienced and they're seen as having less responsibility because the children are at an age where you don't have to have eyes on all the time. Um, but they're just under the amount of pressure and the way that women and men are set at a different standard. That amount of pressure just becomes too much with all of the additional physical and mental things that are going on within the body that they take a step back completely leave the industry go to a role that takes less stress less time and these women are amazing role models who we just lose and um, I, I am aware of us losing women from the workplace at that age but do we have any data linking it to say um, having to wear PPE gear, you know, is there any link between the PPE gear? Apparently, so. Um, Speak Out Revolution recently had a questionnaire sent round that they sent inside Bonus Brass as well as doing a lot wider, and they found it was. I can't remember what the first reason was that women didn't feel like they belonged, but the second was poorly fit in PPE. Which so is that was the function. second reason, um, uh, as in the, the the second most common or most prevalent or strongest reason. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, you know, again, it's something that I just tolerated and never questioned until I started to consume some of what of the, the um, content that you're putting out. And it makes so much sense. It genuinely makes so much sense. And I do put this down to each generation needing to be a little bit better. Um, that and, and needing to make things a little bit better and needing to improve things um a little bit more. So I really welcome the work that you're doing, and I I'm so happy to to promote it and talk about it in Ireland because obviously the Irish experience will be no different um than the the experience in South Wales or the rest of the UK or or anywhere where women are experiencing um, these issues. So um, you might just, just before we finish up today, Catherine, I, I'm genuinely grateful for the work that you're doing. How can people get involved and support you? But, uh, speaking up, um, if they want to contact me through Boulders Brass, I have a, I have a set speech on why we should be in women's PPE, not unisex or men's. If they wanted to just use that as an email to send it to a person who has some sort of influence in their company. Also, stop buying men's. If you have men's bought for you or you are a person who's purchasing PPE, stop getting the unisex, stop buying men's for women. You are covering up the problem. If we can show that there is a market for women's PPE, because that's one of the main reasons people don't produce it, and we do have many, many manufacturers who are making fantastic women's PPE. It's just not making it into suppliers. It's not being purchased by the purchasing department. It's not making it to the end user. The end user needs to have PPE to fit their body. It's the first P in PPE. It's personal. Yet I think rethinking your generic rules about footwear. Um, if I think of one of like the metatarsal introduction of metatarsal boots it took a very long time to get metatarsal boots that were for women i think it was only maybe it was it before christmas that you could actually buy a pair of metatarsal women's, women's boots yet these rules blanket rules have been in companies for five years that you must wear metatarsal boots have a look at the risk have a look at the hazard um work it out is it actually enough to okay. everyone um, Catherine, I think that's really compelling. So, right, our, our ask for the industry um, this week is take a look at who's procuring, who's purchasing this PPE gear. And while you haven't said it in this interview, I've heard you say it uh, numerous times before, there is no such thing as unisex PPE. And I think 
that that's a really important starting point. So don't don't fall back on that. And look, I, I just want to reiterate actually your point there as in PPE uh, gear. The first P means personal. So therefore, it has to be personal. And, you know, again, just to remind people that that this conversation, you know, yes, it falls under the EDI conversation, but actually it's really important that uh, we refer back to what Catherine uh, was saying at the start, that it's not this is not just a gender issue. It is about being other in a workplace and anything we can do to eliminate the feeling of others so that people know they belong in the workplace um, is really what's important for us. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. And I would encourage anybody to take a look at the work that you're doing and to take a look at the work of the Boulders Brass Foundation. Um, we, we certainly want to encourage that and encourage people across the industry in Ireland to get involved. That was Catherine Evans, founder of Boulders as Brass. It's our thanks to show producer Katie Tallon and to the production team at Hear Me Roar Media. Also, thanks to Place Engage for making these conversations possible. Uh, if you enjoyed the episode, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out all of the other construction and real estate shows on iProperty Radio. Thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode of Breaking Ground on iProperty Radio. Three, two, one.